Thompson once again and um, Ron is back with us by popular demand a lot of you asked for more of Ron so uh, so we brought him back for uh, for some more wonderful stories from the from the wilds of Africa um, Ron thanks so much for giving us your time um, last time we spoke we didn't really finish the rhino series um, and I believe you've got some more stories about that for example before Rupert was gored you were knocked down by a large rhino cow? Yes, I was. Tell us about that. <laughs> okay. What I must first explain is that in the modern day and age, hunters find stories like this uh, intriguing, um, but they'll never find them again. The, 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 the stories that, that I'm relating here happened in a colonial era, which is now long gone. Yeah. And it wasn't the same thing like hunters today go out and they shoot for trophies or they shoot for meat or what have you, and they enjoy their hunting, which is great. But uh, the kind of hunting that we were doing was, was management hunting. We were um, killing big game animals because they were problem animals. And we were killing, we were catching things like rhinos because we wanted to, to secure breeding units in the national parks. Um, and the, I find that a lot of people find my stories extraordinary because they can't relate to that era. I'd just like to explain with the, with the, the, the black rhinos, um, it was a very fascinating for me. Um, I was a very highly accomplished elephant and buffalo and lion hunter and these sorts of things because it was my job. Um, at any time I could be called out on a phone that a lion had killed somebody's cows and go and, go and shoot it or an elephant was was raiding people's crops and it was repetitive. It was my job. And on, on, on the rhino capture, I think what we have to understand is that nobody knew anything in those days about the rhino. Nobody knew that the black rhino, for example, nobody knew that the black rhino was first of all, a nocturnal animal. It, it, it spent the whole night out um, eating. Uh, and I mean the whole night. It used to then return to, to the thickets in the early morning 
just after the dawn, and then it would find a place in these very heavy thickets in the Zambezi Valley where it would go to sleep. Um, it would, when it found a place to sleep, it would sniff the wind, find which way the wind was blowing, turn its bottom into the wind, and it would lie down in amongst the carpet of leaves that you found in the thickets. And the, these, this carpet of leaves was up to six, six inches thick. And we had to get in into this place and to put a dart in into the into the rhino. We weren't using high-powered weapons. We were using a CO2 powered in the early days. We were using a CO2 powered um, dog catching gun, which fired darts. It was designed actually to catch stray dogs in the inner cities of America. Of, of America. And Tony Hartwin, a, a Southern African veterinary guy cottoned onto this, converted it so that we could catch rhinos. Now, I want you to understand how difficult this was. I found that the rhino capture operations that I did were infinitely more interesting, more thrilling, um, more empowering than hunting any leopards or lions or elephants or buffaloes that I had ever done. This, this was something very, very unusual. And um, you had to have very good hunting skills to be able to get close enough in that thick bush in the Zambezi Valley to be able to fire a dart into it. The darts had a maximum range of 25 meters. And that means that when you put the gun 45 degrees in the sky, that's how far the dart flew. So you can imagine the, the practical way of putting a dart into a rhino um, in the thickets was that you had to get very close. And, and it, the bush was so thick, you also had to get a totally clear shot at it. And that was well nigh impossible until you got very close. A rhino, to dart a rhino in the Zambezi Jess was between six and 13 yards. That's a hell of a close. So um, to get that close with all those thick leaves lying on the ground, um, you, I, I developed a technique where I would squat down and I'd remove all the leaves on the ground where I could put my feet and so on until I got up to that length. M meanwhile, the rhino is lying there sound asleep in the bush. It's often covered in oxpeckers and the oxpeckers warn the rhino if they see anybody approaching it. And of course the, the rhinos with his bottom sticking into the wind means that in, if you approach behind and wanted to put a needle into its backside, um, you couldn't do that because the rhino had arranged itself so that your smell would go onto the rhino. And it lay there with its ears, its head on the ground, and its ears going like antennae back and forth, back and forth, all the time throughout the day. Even although it was sound asleep, it was listening to everything around it. So it was impossible to get up to it. And that's what made it so exciting and what made it a usual way of hunting. And of course, it was a very dangerous animal. I was knocked down several times. Rupert was gored. Other people were gored badly. Um, so we, we, we had a very difficult adversary. And um, uh, every time we got a dart in, it was a great success. To begin with, we, got, we darted about one elephant, uh, one rhino rather, um, a week, sometimes two, but we were lucky if we got any more than that. Later on, when we converted our, gun, our guns into, uh, into powered guns, which were fired with a 0.22 humane killer blank, um, I was able to put a dart in at 80 meters into a target that was three inches round. So we changed, we changed the whole nature of the hunting. Uh, the first year I worked under Rupert until he was gored. Um, and after that, I was on my own. So we, we taught ourselves, we had to teach ourselves. One of the is issues that we found was that normally if you're hunting elephants or buffalo, you pick up last night's tracks and you follow them and you find them sometime during the day lying in the shade, and you hope, and you're able to shoot them um, because they were wide awake. And this didn't happen with the rhinos. We followed, started off following the rhinos throughout their entire nocturnal ventures um, until they walked back in at eight o'clock the next morning into the thickest to go to sleep. And we, we eventually ended up saying this is ridiculous because we know that the tracks we are on are all last. You never find any to, any of the daylight spur because it didn't walk around during the day, except in the very early morning and the late afternoon. So we we, we decided on an, on another way of doing this, and uh, that was to to get up early in the morning and to patrol the, the edges of the big heavy thickets 
um, because we were expecting the rhinos then to move into the thickets. We knew how they moved, where they moved, where they were, but we had to try and catch them when they were still outside pre-dawn and we could catch them in the open and dart them. And that was very successful, but we still had to go into the thickets to, to dart them. Now I was on the, the story I would like to tell you about where I was knocked down by a, a big cow, um, took all that into account. I, I was out on my own with, with a bunch of trackers, with my own tracker and with a couple of other guys carrying water bags and things like that. Um, and we were walking around the edges of the thickets looking for spoor and, and not just looking for spoor, but listening for the rhinos feeding. The black rhino eats sticks, normally as thick as your fingers. Sometimes they will take, they'll bite something uh, as, as thick as your wrist. They, they eat, for example, some, one of their favorite foods was the narboom, the big, the big uh, euphorbia ingans. They would go up to, to these trees, put their feet on it, pull up, get the chin over a branch and crack it down. And then they would stand there and eat and go back well, night after night after night, come and eat on it because they loved it. And this was filled with, with poisonous milk. I mean, really poisonous milk. But anyway, um, we, we took to going around the thickets, listening for them because when they're eating these sticks at about a, in, in, the, in, the, in the quiet of the dawn, you can hear them crunch, 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 crunch as they're chewing the stick. They chew the whole stick right down to the leaves at the end to where they snip it off. And they snip it off. Um, if you look at the branch that it snipped off, it looks as if someone has just cut it off with a pair of secateurs. And they chew that whole stick into their mouth. And you can hear it 200 yards away in, in, in the early morning. You can hear the crumb, 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 crumb. And then you go into, you check the wind, go in, into that sound with your nose into the wind. And that's how we, we caught our best rhinos. Those were the easiest hunts. I just so, interrupt you, Ron. Um, sorry, you, every now and again, you periodically, you break up. Um, so sometimes I miss something. Um, it, um, I, I missed, did you say that white rhino eat grass and black rhino eat sticks? Yes, okay. it's one of their fundamental differences. If they're eating acacias, there's no poisonous milk in the acacias. Yeah. Um, Acacia karoo is known as this, is, is this, the soot during in, in South Africa, the sweet thorn. And it's one of the favorite foods of the rhino, of the black rhino. Yeah. Um, but the big green cactus you get all over Southern Africa, it's filled with white milk latex yeah. that is highly, highly poisonous. And the yeah. rhinos love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Black rhinos love it. They pull down these branches and they come back night after night until there's nothing left. And then they pull down another branch. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, we, we took to, to, to going out um, before the crack of dawn. When the dawn was breaking, we were out there because the rhinos were still on the verges of the thickets, normally acacia sticks, because that was their favorite. And you could hear them crunch, crunch, crunching as they were eating the sticks. Um, it was a dead giveaway. You could hear you could hear the rhino chewing its sticks. You then knew it was there. So what you did, you test the wind. And fortunately, at the dawn, there was often no wind at all. It was the air was dead still, but it meant you could get into the rhino close enough to fire a dart and get it into it. We always used to say that if you fired your dart, I fired my dart and it stuck was a favorite. We loved to know because then we knew we had a rhino. We it then ran away. And we had to follow it and it would run for half an hour in the early days when we were using morphine sulfate as the drug but it, it ran for half for a hell of a long way before the drug took effect and you had to keep following it and if you had if you had other rhinos in the area you had to be pretty slick on your tracking this is why our bushman trackers were so important to us anyway this one morning uh, the story i want to tell you now is one morning um, we were wandering around the ed edge of a thicket looking for tracks, listening for the, the rhinos feeding, um, and the sun was just coming up. Uh, we had this rhino come out of the thicket, it was actually moving, it was in the thicket, came out of the thicket, and it walked down on my right-hand side, not very really far away. And it ran, it, it, went, it didn't run, it didn't know we were there, and it walked down an elephant path, it was going to some other thicket that it wanted to go and sleep in during that day. But suddenly we were confronted with a very big and very pregnant black rhino cow walking across our front. Um, and we thought, well, this is it, we can do it. The wind was right. 
And this rhino was, was walking quite fast, but it wasn't at all alarmed. So I quickly tucked in behind, followed it down the path. Now we had just walked up this valley and it was going to a place where I knew it would very soon cross our, our, our own tracks of that morning. And that meant the rhino would be alerted. It would immediately smell us and it would know that we were in the area and that would probably scrick it. So I wanted to get my dart into this rhino before it crossed our spur, our earlier spur. So I was going down this, this path to try and catch it. And it, it came to the track. I, I thought if it, if it smells it, it's not just going to run off. It's going to stop and it's going to assess the situation. And I wanted them to be right behind it to get my dart into its buttocks. Well, it didn't do as, as it didn't do as it was supposed to do. It just spun around and it ran back up the path that had just come down, um, back towards the thicket that it had just been in. And there was little old me standing in the open Wampani felt with his rhino now belting up this path in a full gallop, trying to get away from us. So I turned and ran because there was no there were no trees to climb. Everything was just open Mopani bush or Mopani woodland. So I ran back and there are little bushes in the Zambezi Valley um, linked to the shepherd tree. It's they're called Bossia, Bossia malensis. It grows to about three feet high and it's a, it's a thicket about three or four meters across, but very thick, but very small. The, the branches aren't even as thick as my fingers. Anyway, I ran back to this and I, now this rhino, if it hasn't seen me, it won't see me sitting behind this bush. And right in front of me, the elephant path up which this rhino was running, took a bend and went into the thicket. And I thought, well, this is dead right. I'll sit behind this thick bush. This rhino will come racing up towards me. It will follow its own tracks. It will turn on the elephant path and go back into the thicket where it came. That means it would be about five or six meters from me when it turned the corner. And when it turned the corner, if it carried on running, it would give me 20 or 30 meters of, of running space, all that I needed to get a dart into its buttock as it ran past. And I thought, well, now I'm quids in, this rhino is going to get a dart in it this morning up. And it, it didn't go on the bend as it was supposed to do. It hadn't read the script. And it came straight through this thicket. Now I was, I was squatted down behind this thicket. Remember it's, it's very, very thick, absolutely dense, but it's only three feet high. And this rhino came through the other side, straight at me. And then I thought, oh, oh, we've got a bit of a problem on our hands now. So it came full ball for me and I stood up or knelt up because I was kneeling on the ground. I knelt up so that my head and shoulders were above this thick bush. And, um, and the rhino was then entering the bush at the other side. I mean, it was, it's, it's, I would say it was two meters away from me. And um, it was coming at a full, a full I stood up, put, put my rifle towards it aimed at its chest and I pulled the trigger and the dart hit it in the chest. And this, now, now my, my barrel was almost underneath its chin. It, I was so close to it. Um, it then started puffing as they do <laughs> like that. And it, came, it put its head down and I just saw this horn coming towards me. So I fell backwards. I jumped to the side. I dropped my weapon because you can't do it's no good to you once the dart has gone. It only fired one dart. Now this thing then, came it then saw me and it came for me it didn't didn't slow down at all it just came full bore i turned and jumped to one side um as this was happening so i i had to get somewhere beyond where the rhino because just the, the horn was right there and as i as i went through um this rhino's horn came out happens with the rhino with the black rhino is if it hooks if it goes for you and it hooks you with its horn or hooks tries to hook you with its horn and it misses the next thing it did it would smack its head sideways and it would smack you sideways um rupert had um bones broken and everything like that when when this happened to him with a big black rhino bull now i was in this predicament and when when this this horn came past me i saw it it was within touching distance of me on my on my right hand side and and as this happened, as my hands touched the ground, I tried to bounce off the ground from where the rhino was, was coming at me. The horn came, it started to swing its head sideways. Um, I dived further to the side on, as far as I could, but going sideways, I had to turn my body and this, the front 
face, his front face and the horn smacked me right in the middle of the back. And I went flying off to the one side. Fortunately, it was the, the rhino was in such a, a scare that it often panted and galloped over the top of me and it was away. And I was left lying on the ground. I couldn't breathe. All the air had been knocked out of me. It was a hell of a smack. It was like, it wasn't like, it wasn't like having a, um, a house fall on top of you. It was a fact that the, the house was flying at you. And, it was, and that's what hit you, like a baseball bat hitting a ball. And um, I took a, quite a few minutes to, to regain my breath. My trackers were all over me, trying to find, find out what was wrong, trying to, to get me to, to breathe and what have you. And eventually, um, the rhino ran on into the thicket. And uh, my tracker came up to me and he, he said, are you all right, sir? Are you okay? So I said, yes, I'm okay. I said, listen, just 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 look down through the through my the back of my pants here and see if if the if that horn got me because my whole back it was just totally flattened, one massive big bruise. And um, eventually they they got me going. They they put a water bag to my to my mouth and forced me to drink. Apparently it was um, it was imperative that I have a drink. At least the trackers thought that they really didn't know what to do because they'd never had this happen to us before. But eventually I managed to get up and I stretched myself and it, was, it really was a hell of a smack. And uh, we followed the rhino. My tracker said to me, are you all right? Are we, are we still going to follow it and go and find it? I said, yes, of course. There's a dart in it, in here in the chest. So we followed it and we eventually picked it up and we took it back into the pens. Um, it was a lovely big pregnant uh, cow. And then R Rupert Fothergill had been out somewhere else. He hadn't been successful at all. And... Uh, he said, come, let's have a look at this back of yours. And then he told me on Operation Noah that he'd been, he'd been under, under a rhino twice before. He never told me this, that he had been hit by rhinos. Um, but anyway, he says, I, I know what you're feeling. Let's have a look. Take your shirt off. So I took my shirt off and he started to laugh. He says, you have got the perfect imprint curved horn from your buttocks right up your back to your shoulder. It's a perfect shape. And it's all just one massive big bruise. And he says... He said to me, he said, but I've got just the thing for you. Just you lie down on the bed. And my, this big ugly nurse, uh, <laughs> Rupert, he got this bottle of stuff out of his medical kit. He put it on my back and he gently massaged this stuff into my back. I was tender as all hell, I might tell you. And uh, then uh, when he'd finished, he said, just lie there. He said, this is, he said, you think it's sore now, wait until tomorrow. <laughs> he said, you're going to have a problem tomorrow. <laughs> and then he put this stuff and I could smell turpentine and all sorts of things on it. When he'd finished, I said, what is that stuff you put on my back? He said, you won't get this from any, any medical doctor. He said, um, this is the only thing that's worked for me all my life. And he was, Rupert was twice my age. And he, uh, I was in about mid twenties. He was in his middle fifties. And, um, uh, I said, what is it? He said, here, have a look. And it was, it was veterinary embrocation made for horses with banged hocks and sore ankles and this sort of thing. It was a, a medical embrocation. And since that day, I've still got upstairs. I, I've forgotten to bring it down. I was going to show you. It's still in my medical kit. I get Ellis, Ellis horse, horse, um, horse embrocation which arm and uh, within a week I was back hunting rhinos but that was a very very scary trick we had a number of really similar things but that that will give you some idea of what it was like hunting black rhinos you were charged by a big male rhino on the rear another instance where you had absolutely nowhere to go <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that was quite normal and and there were no trees to climb so you had to find other ways of avoiding this big monsters um and we've been following these tracks all morning and we, we came through a jess out into an open mapani felt in the jess there this is comprised of, an, of a bush called combretum elagnoides which the rhinos never ate the elephants don't eat it either but they push through it and it gives them the, the cover that they're looking for when a rhino goes to sleep in thickets like that what it's it's searching for security it's searching for a bit of privacy so that it can get away from all the other animals that it shares the, the habitat with um but it doesn't eat it um and this rhino knew that outside the thicket it was still hungry there were there were acacia karoo bushes 
which the rhinos love. Following the tracks, I was expecting to bump into it um, in about half an hour's time, but I got a surprise. We walked right into its backside and it was standing there in front of us eating, eating a, a Kesha Karoo bush. So I had other people with me and I just said, sit down, just sit down, sit quiet, don't move. And I walked up in, right out into the open after this rhino to go and put a dart in and shooting with a dart. With a rifle, you can push your bullet through the bush. You can't do that with a dart. If the dart doesn't have a completely open avenue to target and it hits a twig, then the dart deflects or it tumbles. So you, you have to, the, 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 after all the trouble you, you go to, to to get up close to a rhino, you don't want to mess it up by not having a clear shot at the rhino. So anyway, here we had a, this thing landing in our lap. We, the rhino is right in front of me. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm now talking about four or five yards away. Um, and, and I sneaked up to it. And there was a little twig of bush low down on the leg. I thought, well, I can miss that. I'll just lift my, my dart a little higher and I'll, I'll put the dart in above that twig. Well, Job's, what's it? Job's law. Um, I fired my dart, it hit the twig, it tumbled, it smacked sideways onto the rhino, and this rhino got one hell of a scrick, and it ran off. When it was gone, off through the bush. Uh, it didn't know what was behind it because the wind was in our favor. So I just stood dead still, let it run away, and I said, okay, fine, bring in my pack. We had carried a big drug pack with us. I opened up the, I picked up the dart, we found it, but where it had impacted, the mechanism for injecting the dart had activated and all the drug had come out through the needle and onto the ground. So we'd lost all that, all that um, material. So I had to then mix new drugs, get a new dart, load it up and everything, which I did there and then in the field, put it into, into my capture gun to go and, um, and try again. And when we'd finished, off we went again on the rhino spur. Now I wasn't expecting to find that rhino for an hour or two. We went over the first little, little bit of high ground, following a very wide elephant pass. And there right in front of me was this big black rhino bull standing, waiting. And he'd had his, he had his head in the thicket. <coughs> so his backside was stuck out on the elephant pass. But there was a, there was an, the elephants had been feeding in the area and um, the, the previous day. And there was a sprig, a branch, Mopani branch hanging over the elephant pass between me and the rhino. And I had to get up very close to it because I couldn't shoot that. I couldn't dart the rhino. I could hit the rhino from where I was. Um, that branch was in the way. So I had to go up to that branch, walking along the elephant path. And um, I stuck, the, I stuck the, the barrel of the capture gun through this branch over the, over the elephant path. I aimed at the, at the buttocks and I pulled the trigger and the dart hit and it stuck. And then the rhino, all it did was it reversed out of, I couldn't see its head, it was in the bush. It reversed out of this backwards, like a good car driving up. And it was then facing me direct on, and it was only 10 yards from me on this clear elephant path. There was Mopani woodland around further down. There was a big branch and saw had fallen or been pulled off a tree. And I reckon I could climb up that and get, get above the rhino. And with a rhino, if you're six feet above the ground, it doesn't, doesn't matter how small the tree is. It doesn't push the tree down. It'll stand there and look at you and then run away. But you're generally safe if you could climb six feet above the ground. You anyway, now I had this rhino belting down the, 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 the path at me. It could see me very clearly. And it was coming full bore. And it was a dominant bull. And it wanted my guts for garters. There's no doubt about it. And when I looked up ahead of me, I had a whole bunch of I had a young game ranger with me who was coming to try to learn how to dart rhinos. He never, ever made the grade. I had my tracker with me and I had two two other black guys who were carrying, one was carrying the water bags and they were on a little anthill and there was one tree on the anthill. And when that runner turned around and took off, all of these guys, or what did I say, five of them, including the one white man and the four black men, they were all trying to climb this one tree at the same time. And I tell you, I was in dire straits. I had a rhino coming up my backside, coming full ball for me. And I know he wanted me. And I was running like hell and all I could see was this, this Walt Disney action in front of me, all these guys pulling each other out of the tree and they're affecting me. This guy. <laughs> I can remember seeing this and being amused by it, but the other thing that wasn't very amusing was this rhino behind me. And I could feel that every time his front hoof hit the ground, it was going 
right behind me. It's a very frightening sound. And uh, I could feel it getting closer to me. I passed the branch that I thought I could climb. I was past it before I even realized I'd reached it. And the Bushmen had a, had a, a trick that when they were chased by elephants or running and the, and the animals was right behind them, they would grab hold of a sapling with one hand and spin around it. They'd just pivot around it and then run off at 90 degrees to, to, to where the elephant or the buffalo was charging them, they would run off straight off to the left hand side. And nine times out of 10, the animal that was chasing them would carry on running and just leave them behind. So this was going through my mind and I thought, I've got to find a tree like this to get, to get past this rhino. So I came to a Mapani tree, stood, I pulled myself around at full ball running and I shot off at 90 degrees to the left. And this rhino, I didn't bother to look around because that would have wasted time. This rhino was a little bit further away from me than I thought it was. And when it saw me cut to the left, it just cut across the corner and it gained on me. So it was a useless gesture. Now, all around me, I had Mapani branches and trees that had been pushed down by the elephants the previous day. Fast and so hard, my legs felt like lead. I, I could hardly pick them up one after the other. And these trees were all, branches were lying down about, a, some of them about a foot above the ground. My legs eventually couldn't lift that one foot above the ground. So in, what in, inevitably happened, my toe caught under a branch, my other foot went over the top, and I caught the branch between my two legs as I was running, and down I went, boom, onto the ground. And this rhino was right behind me. So when I hit the ground, the rhino again was right on top of me, and I rolled to the side of me. It again tried to hook me with this horn. It missed. Um, I saw the eye going past my eye a matter of inches away. Then the front legs came over the top of my legs. I then, the rhino ran, ran over the top of me and I was lying beneath it and it was trying to get at me. And every time it bent its legs to get down, this great big fat tummy was pushing me into the ground. And um, the next thing I knew was that it, it was past me. How its feet missed me, I don't know, because they were all around me. And then it put its foot down between, um, um, a part of its foot went through the fork and it jammed in the ankle. Now the rhino couldn't get away from this, from this branch. Now it started fighting the branch. It forgot about me. And I was now behind it. Its backside was within spitting distance of me. But it was fighting the branch to try and get its foot out of the branch. And it was running around with this fork around its branch, with dragging the branch all over the place, puffing and panting like a banshee. And it was getting crosser and crosser and crosser. But it forgotten about me. I just lay there. I didn't move. I thought, I'm not going to attract any attention to myself. If this rhino sees me move, it's going to have a go at me. So I just froze and I lay behind it. Fortunately, it didn't turn very much around. It was side and sideways and sideways. And eventually out came its foot from the fork. And instead of turning around to, to gore me, it ran on and into the thickets up ahead. And, it's, and we managed to pick it up and take it back to the pens. And we caught it. It was then released in Wanky National Park. But oh. that... That, that is quite a story. <laughs> Telling me. Those kinds of stories really can't happen in today's world. Mm. They were very exciting, very, very exciting. And I did that sort of thing for seven years. And I captured a move together with the ones when starting with Rupert, but he was with me only for, for one year. We shared the thing for one year. Then he was badly gored. Um, but we had all sorts of... of of issues. So Richard Peake in, in the rhino pen got a, throw, a, a horn through his shin and out through his calf at the back of his leg and he was he was lucky that someone saw him and grabbed him and pulled him out which is another story but the, the big thing is getting up to those rhinos so close in those thickets under those Apparently you shot one uh, rhino that was a male that was charging you, you shot it in the skull with your dot with your... <laughs> Yeah, when, when, when I'd um, I was fed up trying to use these um, these CO2 pressurized capture guns. We were firing a dart that was 12 inches long, full of drugs. It was a very heavy dart. And they didn't have the power. I mean, they, they'd been designed to shoot dogs with, with little 1cc darts. We were giving them 11, 12cc darts. And they were very heavy uh, and very ineffective. And we, we had so much problem and we, we escaped getting gored by so many inches, so closely, so many times. I said, no, we've got to do something about this. 
I'd been down to Natal, to Umfolosi, where we picked up white rice, at least, I think, 66 um, into Rhodesia, most of them into Wanki. Um, Natal Parks Board gave us white rhino, uh, and I went down with them. But they were using a capture gun there with, with powder charge. And their, their capture gun was actually a 12-gauge shotgun, uh, sorry, a 20-gauge shotgun. And they use shotgun blanks to project their, their, their darts. The, the big problem with using powder charges is that if you have, uh, if you've got a, a flammable, um, you, you had to have a tailpiece on your dart. And then most of the tailpieces were made of, of clumps of wool. And that was like a parachute. Its purpose was to hold the dart even. Now, um, when you fired them with a, with a shotgun shell inside, the burning powder set that alight and <laughs> you could get a trailing smoke trail as the dart was flying towards the rhinos. So we used to um, put them in our mouths and soak them with spit before we, we fired them. But the fact that they were using powder charges to fire their darts was a thing that intrigued me. So I had a 400, 450 Farquharson action falling block rifle, which meant that one of the big problems with the CO2 ones, you had to dismantle the, the bolt to get the, the, the dart in. With that one, when you drop the, the, the load, you could put a three-foot dart in there if you wanted to. So they were perfect. So I had one made up, a friend of mine made one up um, with an old capture gun barrel, and he put feather flights on the back. Now we had the same problem there of burning, but we, we started, started using 0.22 humane killer blanks. In, in, a, in an abattoir, you, you, you kill oxen, with a, a dot, with a stun gun, which has got a little thing that comes out and it's fired with a, with a, a 0.22 blank. Um, we use those to fire our darts and then uh, the feathers to stop them burning and all this sort of thing. But when we got those darts, they were powerful. Um, the needles that we were using on the, on the um, CO2 darts or the, the darts that we fired with the CO2 rifles, um, the needles weren't strong enough to withstand the impact when we fired them with my Farquharson action capture gun and a 2-2 blank because they, they, were, they were going very fast. But the rhino skin is very thick, so it could, it could, the rhino skin could, could withstand those on them. And as I said, 80 yards, I was putting my darts consistently into a bull that was only three inches round. So um, there were obvious advantages. But... Um, when we got it all working, I mean, in, in one month, for example, I captured 23 rhinos and, and moved them. Um, that was never heard of before. And it was only because we had good quality weapons in those days. But they flew those things when they hit the it's rhinos. It's 10 hours. The rhinos, the rhinos could feel it. I could feel the thump when they went in, but, but they never injured the rhino. So with the, if those things could deter a rhino to charge, I didn't, I didn't try to make it happen. But when it happened, I was prepared to give it a go and see what happens. And um, in this case, I'd followed this rhino down um, into a little stream and went up onto the other side on the bank on the other side. And it was very open. But because the stream had river sand in it at the bottom, I could walk over the top there very quietly, very silently. So I sneaked up behind this rhino. It saw me more than her around. It was on, an, on the river bank a little bit higher than I was. So it had the advantage, the height advantage, if you like. And uh, it just put his head down and came at me full bore, full bore. And it came down off, off the bank and it was with me in the riverbed virtually when I pulled the trigger. And the, the dart hit it right in the middle of the forehead. Now rhinos have got a big pun, a spongy cushion on the black rhinos anyway, on their foreheads. And that is largely to absorb the the thrusts of other rhinos when they're fighting, when their horns go together like this, that's where they're hitting. And that's where I aimed as it came down, right in the middle of the head and I pulled the trigger. And quite frankly, um, people said to me, what, what if you killed it? I said, I said, I couldn't care a damn whether I killed that rhino or not. It was either I was gonna kill it or it was gonna kill me. And I'd rather that it died. In, in fact, it didn't die at all. The, the dart hit it right fair square in the middle. The needles we were using, were two and a half inches long. They were made, they were um, three sixteenths of an inch thick. They were actually diesel injector tubing, which we had put screws on and put into the end of the dart. We'd sharpened, we put a, a cone on it, not a barb. And this whole thing with the cone and everything sunk right into the, into the animal's skull. And it came, stopped it up against the, 
base of the dart or the front end of the dart. And this rhino stopped absolutely dead. I don't think it realized what had hit it. It stood absolutely dead right in front of me. I had nothing else. I had one dart to, to fire. The dart, dart gun was now empty. So all, all, all I had learned to do in a lot of instances of the big game is rather than run and draw attention to yourself, you just stand absolutely dead still. Four yards in front of me with this, with this dart sticking on its forehead. And it stood there and it looked at me and it spun around and it took off and it ran. And we followed it and followed it and followed it and we found it asleep. But I couldn't get the dart out. Uh, and I wriggled it and wiggled it and everything. And eventually, the end of the dart, including the, the brass cone that we had in was, was acting as a barb, that snapped off. So it had about an inch and a half of the dart embedded in its skull. And we, we, gave, we used to use anti-mastitis uh, injections. We had little, um, um, every time we darted around it, we put one of these in there and we squirted this anti-mastitis, put it in the teats of cattle when they've got mastitis and it's an antibiotic. We put it into the holes uh, where the darts ma made or the dart needles made on the rhino's skin and we did it in there. And that, if we didn't do that, it separated for a long time uh, after a day or two. So I got some, one, some of this and I filled this hole up with fill of it. But we released that runner into the Ghana Rijol. And, uh, and it was all right. There was no problem with it. But uh, that was another adventure that most people could only dream about. You know, I, I often think that the, the people who hear these stories think that I'm, excuse my language, think that I'm the biggest bullshitter ever. But I can assure you that what I'm, uh, they can't relate to it because that that could never happen, could never happen in uh, in South Africa today, where I'm living now. Um, but with with rhinos, with with lions, with elephants, buffaloes, we had all sorts of stories like that, which which would be very difficult to duplicate in the modern day and age in modern South Africa.